Welcome into Stacking the Box. I am your host, Sterling Holmes. No Ian McMillan this week. Joined instead by Mike Luciano for the entire hour. Mike, how are you? I'm doing all right. Uh, as long as my quarterback's leg doesn't explode, I'm feeling pretty okay. So last year, not so great. This offseason, eh, a little better. Uh, if you can't tell by now, yeah, he is a Jets fan. We'll be joined by Sarah Marshall, talking Patriots with her in just a moment. We'll be talking some Raiders with Murph around 420 and Reed Wallach at 440, talking Giants. Before we get into the NFL draft, a little deep dive on a few teams. DraftKings is offering a fantastic sign-up bonus for new users. New customers can place a $5 first bet on any sport to instantly claim $150 in bonus bets when you sign up with our code STB. The best part is that you will receive your rewards even if your first bet loses. Using our code STB not only gets you these great bonuses, but also directly supports our podcast. If you've been considering setting up for DraftKings, make sure to use the code STB to maximize your first bets. This offer is only available to new customers who are 21 plus and physically present in legal gambling states. Please remember to always gamble responsibly. Check the episode description for the full terms of the offer to see if you qualify. Sarah Marshall with Musket Fire. Sarah, how are you? I'm good. How are you guys? Golden. I'm a Chiefs fan, so things are always <laughs> great over here. We don't have to worry as much about, about Mike. And I would say, Sarah, for the longest time, you didn't have to worry either. You should know what it feels like in my spot, because now I feel like I know what it was like in your spot. But what's yeah. it feel like now with all this uncertainty in New England? You can probably tell from these fans online that they grew up in the Tom Brady era. So this is complete. And it, you know, as, as, as scary as it is, I feel like there's a little bit of excitement though, because you kind of don't know what to expect. There's a lot of changes from top to bottom. So I'm trying to just be optimistic and be open to, to what we could be doing and bracing for a slower rebuild than what most people are, are hoping for. <laughs> Uh, with the third overall draft pick, you know, you're behind two teams that are obviously in the uh, in the need of a QB with Chicago with one overall, Washington with two. Is there a certain feel of, well, quarterback or bust, obviously. Mm -hmm. Is there a certain feel of which quarterback to go after? Are you happy if it's Drake May? Are you happy if it's Daniels? Is it going to be the wild card of J.J. McCarthy, who's been flying up draft boards? Where do Patriots fans land here? It's a split. I call it a core quarterback carousel. That's basically what it is. I mean, the same thing with the mock drafts. It just depends on the week who the favorite is. We've gone through all of them. And I, for the most part, from what I'm seeing, it looks like people are very not on board with JJ McCarthy. I'm not really sure why I'm not a college football person, but I'm just like quarterback, whatever. Let's see. Like it, we need a quarterback. So if they believe it could be McCarthy, then I'm fine. Um, but it really is a toss up between May and Daniels. And of course we know the commanders are going to dictate who, who they have the option of at three. So we're going to have to just embrace whoever that is. <laughs> see, there was looking at new England. I remember there was kind of a movement of, are they going to take Marvin Harrison jr? Are they maybe mm -hmm. going to trade out of three because the, the the quarterback debate has always been, do you just get the top prospect and he'll make a lot of the, the pitfalls, overcome a lot of that, or do you just build up the best possible team around him and then do you take the quarterback? Because last year we kind of got both extremes. We got C.J. Stroud who went to a horrible team and was great, and right. the Texans are good, and then we went to Bryce Young who also went to a horrible team and got killed. So and looking, and I look, looking at the Patriots roster, though, I think you'd even say this is not like – a particularly deep or skilled, just one to 53 because they're rebuilding. Is there any thought of like, let's just take best player available, which is probably going to be Marvin Harrison, maybe just take it on the chin for a year quarterback and then figure something out later. You know, I'm open to that. I've been open to that. Like I I'm not one of those people that's quarterback or bust. I mean, of course, when you're at such a high position in the draft, it's like, yeah, 
you take the guy that you need and the quarterback is the most important position on the team. So yeah, but you also don't want to run into the Panther situation. You don't want to have another Mac Jones experiment that blows out after three years. So I would rather they go after the guy that they want. Like if it's a quarterback and let's say the commanders take whoever they want, pass on the quarterback, then trade down with a team like the Vikings, get some more picks, build up that offense and deal with the quarterback later. Like they have Jacoby Brissett. He's not, you know, the franchise guy, but he is reuniting with the offensive coordinator that he saw the best of his career in Alex Van Pelt. So at least he'll be like an okay bridge guy. So if that's the case, I'm for doing exactly what the Texans have been doing. Cause then you're kind of like in that position where you want to be a lot faster than having to go through the Mac Jones, you know, dealing with him for three years, shipping him off for a bag of chips and then getting back to this situation. So I would say the issue is then do you know you're going to get top three the next year? But I would also point out, well, if Jacoby resets your starting quarterback, more than likely, yes, you probably will. Um, also a tough sell for fans, too. If you have all these good years, you finally get the number three pick in a good quarterback draft. And you go, oh, no, we're going to go trade to seven and get a lineman. Fans right. might not be all in on that. Oh, yeah. No, they're not. It's quarterback or bust for most people. I'm like one of the outliers that's like, well, I might entertain the idea of getting two first rounders like with the Vikings. But it's yeah, it's quarterback or bust for sure. Well, not just that. Obviously, the quarterback situation, not ideal with the Patriots, but Bill Belichick now out. What is it like as they transition to the Jared Mayo era? Obviously, I think this was a surprise for a lot of people not in New England. I, I, I thought maybe, hey, Mike Vrabel makes a lot of sense, can from the Titans, but we know he's been a head coach and a head coach elevating his team. Obviously, he almost seems like Bill Belichick, one of the few coaches who have taken his methods and has actually had some success with it, yet they went a different, a different route with Mayo. Were you surprised when the new head coach was announced? And how do you think he'll do, obviously, being so young, ushering in, ushering in this new era? I think the biggest thing was, you know, Mayo is like a legend for Patriots fans, so people like him already. So that wasn't surprising. It was more so about completely foregoing any interview process and just deciding, okay, yeah, we're going with Mayo. He's the guy. And there were rumors that Kraft – wanted to even potentially trade for Vrabel before he was released from uh, the Titans. So it felt like, okay, well, we're going to go from Belichick to another Patriots guy. It just wasn't the Patriots guy that people were thinking. Um, I mean, so far from players and stuff, he's getting great reactions. Like he's exciting for them. It seems like there's completely new energy in the building, which I think is exciting for, you know, the last couple years since Brady left, it's not felt the same, regardless of how they've been performing on the field. Um, I, I think there are certainly question marks because he hasn't been, you know, a defensive or offensive coordinator. He is very young. He seems like a player's coach, which is vastly different than Belichick. So I, you know, you like how much he's supported in the building. It's just, we have so many question marks about how he's going to do. So that is why I think it's a little bit nerve wracking. Like you want to embrace this new era, but you also have no idea how it's going to go. And a lot of time through history, we've seen first time head coaches don't thrive. So that's a little scary. <laughs> I think probably wouldn't have been too desirable of a job because number one, look, you got to follow. And then yep. number two, it's a very expansive rebuild in a very deep AFC. It might take a little bit of time. So you probably wanted a guy who eats nails for breakfast and is kind of a tough guy to, to oversee that. Uh, Sarah, I'm looking at the depth chart right now. And obviously quarterback is the main issue you want to address, but I'm looking at this wide receiver room <laughs> and in a league where you need where wide receivers are as valuable as they've ever been. Even with all the changes in the game, like receivers are in vogue right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing KJ Osborne, Demario Pop Douglas, Juju Smith Schuster, who, wow, that is a regression after leaving Patrick Mahomes. What happened with him mm -hmm. in New England? Even Tyquan Thornton, who was a second round draft pick, who weighs about 130 pounds, soaking wet, and never really adapted to the physicality of the league. I, am I crazy by saying I think they're probably going to take at least two, maybe three receivers in this draft? I mean, this is looking really threadbare for whoever the quarterback is. Oh, no, you're not crazy. I, I think that's what most people want. They want them to double dip. I mean, it's kind of an argument at this point. You know, if they go quarterback in the first, what are they going to do with the 34th pick? 
most people want them to take a receiver over a left tackle, even though we desperately need a left tackle as well. So fortunately, because they're in this situation, both classes are said to be fairly deep, the tackle and, and receiver. So I, I wouldn't mind either way, but they, they need to. And I'm, I think most people actually wanted them to trade for her, somebody. And because it felt like that was the only way that they were going to get that true number one guy that they wanted. And they might have to try and explore that in the draft and hope that they hit it the right way. Because, you know, Tyquan Thornton, as you said, was a second rounder, which was a reach. And he's not been the guy that whatever they, you know, whatever Belichick was hoping he would be, he hasn't become yet. So, but don't forget too, you forgot on your list, Kendrick Bourne. I'm very excited that Kendrick Bourne is back. I know that he's not the flashy, you know, like Tyree Kill type, but he's done really well in New England. So I'm hoping that he'll be able to repeat that after his ACL injury. Be okay. Belichick was a big like speed guy, but he's yeah. A lot of a lot of coaches will do this. Like he can't tell the difference between you're good just running the hundred meters, like a track mm -hmm. guy like Thornton, or a guy like Tyreek, where it actually translates to getting open. And now here you are after. Got probably what 10 years where they haven't really drafted a good receiver and here you are now yep i know so that's that's going to be a big test i think for mayo because it became obviously known with belichick that he wasn't good at drafting receivers so hopefully we don't have to repeat that under mayo and elliot wolf I, I will say i think you're you're correct kendrick Bourne was very underrated i know here in kansas city we, we liked uh, the potential of bringing him here, just a veteran guy that you can trust. Uh, I think Pop Douglas actually had a very nice rookie mm -hmm. season. There's something there. Um, outside, though, of quarterback and wide receiver, you mentioned left tackle. I, I guess if you want to, uh, since that seems to be the, the the main three right here, at 34, is there a wide receiver that's getting a lot of buzz in New England? Is it is it Troy Franklin? Is it uh, Lad McConkey if he were to fall out of the first round? Is there a certain name? that Patriots fans are looking at. Definitely Lad McConkey. That is a name that has been thrown around so much. Ricky Pert. He's is it such Paris a Patriots still? guy. He's such a Patriots. It just, I mean, we yeah. all know what we're thinking when we say that, but I mean, it's. Yes. <laughs> and, and he's, yeah, he's up there. It, it's such a debate too, because, you know, when you say Troy Franklin, from what I'm seeing, so many people are anti Troy Frank Franklin. <laughs> Not sure why, um, but like it is, he's very skinny. Same yeah. So Bill. that's probably what it is. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, there's most of the guys that people are wanting are going to probably be in the first round, like Adonai Mitchell, like he, he's not calling to the second. So, um, yeah, I would say if for the second, definitely McConkey. Um, and yeah, like you guys said, he fits the molds, um, but that's a Belichick mold. So it could, we could see something completely different. We could see Mayo take a liking to somebody else. We just don't know who that is. Looking at New England's defense, because the only way they were winning any games last year was because of that defense. Now, mm -hmm. it's reasonable to ex expect a little bit of a step back because Bill Belichick to Gerard Mayo, it's probably going to be a similar scheme, but you just lose that Belichick sort of wiliness and savvy that he has accrued over all these decades. But looking at it, this is a pretty strong foundation. Matt Judon's going to be back. Kyle Duggar, they just locked up. Christian Gonzalez, when he played last year, Look like a fantastic pick. I don't know how the hell he lasted to pick 17. I remember live on Stack in the Box, we were we couldn't believe that that happened. Do you think there's a chance the Patriots just go defense here? I mean, Mayo is a defensive coach, and he may just say, you know what, this is one of the guys I'm going to pound the table for, maybe high in the second round, because it's at least reinforcing his strength instead of just trusting 21, 22-year-old guys to immediately fill out a starting role. I think it's a, a definitely a possibility given his mindset. You know, he was a defensive guy. He was a linebacker. And then he learned from a defensive minded head coach. So there's that aspect. Plus Dave talked about him and Elliot Wolf have talked about wanting to draft the players and make the team younger and build for the future through the draft. And if they're trying to just build a good team, I really would not be surprised if they did take a defensive guy in the second round because they want to put in these building blocks. And there's quite a few players that they only signed uh, re-signed to the team on a one-year contract and there's a few that will be free agents whether it's like after their rookie uh, rookie contracts are up or, or um, it's just running out so they might be looking at replacements for those guys too and so I yeah it's not ideal for <laughs> most Patriots fans I think they want to stick to the offense but I, I I would not be surprised if there's like an edge player or something that they go after in round two. 
Uh, as far as the offseason moves in totality, can you give us a little update here? You mentioned some of the one-year deals, obviously Kendrick Bourne coming back. Any other moves that we should be aware of? Oh, I would say, well, they brought back Josh Uche. I thought that was an interesting move because he was almost traded last year. And reports were saying that Belichick had a deal basically with the Lions and then it fell through because they weren't offering enough. So that was interesting to me. Also took like a vet minimum contract. <laughs> like he took nothing to come back. Um, I saw the same thing with Hunter Henry. He was re-signed to a three-year contract. He's an older guy, but he's been a solid tight end for the Patriots. So I was happy to see that. I think, uh, oh, Mike Onwenu, fantastic re-signing. A bit expensive, so people weren't thrilled about it. But the offensive line has been in shambles. So I just did not care at that point. I'm like, you know what? Keep some of these great players. You got the money. They still have around $50 million in cap space to be spending right now. So I'm like, throw it throw it at them. I don't care. So I would probably say those guys are exciting. I was hoping to see more extensions, honestly, uh, with like Judon and, and Christian, Christian Barmore, but where they're, they're definitely going at a snail's pace. So that's a little disappointing. Sarah, what would be your message to us, both reassurance to Patriots fans and a warning to the rest of the AFC? Because Right now, the status is, well, we don't really have to worry about New England because yeah. the AFC is, my God, is it deep. I yeah. mean, how many teams outside New England are considered, like, have no shot at the playoffs? Like, one or two, probably? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is an incredibly deep division, and New England probably next year going to be in for some rough sledding. So what's your message to Patriots fans who are a little concerned about how the new era might start and to the rest of the AFC who may be overlooking the Patriots, no matter who they pick at number three? I think people need to be patient. I think that's the biggest thing because I think, you know, you're so used to being successful and being, you know, the, the dad of the NFL, like everyone's trying to get to you and take you down. And there's a new dad in the NFL. And unfortunately that's not us and we're in nowhere near that. So um, I think, you know, you mentioned the Panthers and the Texans and they were both going through these builds that they're trying to make playoff contending teams. And one took their time and one rushed. And we saw exactly what happened with both of them. So I think we need to just temper our expectations, embrace the rebuild and this new era in New England, and hopefully it'll turn out well. I think for the AFC is the message for them, I would say maybe um, – don't rule them out. I think maybe if we're not, we're, I don't expect them to be a, a playoff contender. I don't even know if I expect them to win double digit games, but they, the defense especially played hard. And I think there's a new energy in the building where they're really embracing Gerard Mayo as their new head coach and just the entire staff and that heart and, and, and confidence and determination as like a you a family unit kind of like that can take them far like it might not win them a championship far from it um but i do think that they're going to be a little underestimated so they might be a tougher matchup than people think you know what sarah hmm? i'll give them five games maybe Woo! <laughs> hey that's 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 better than what some people are predicting so you know i don't think anyone was expecting them to get what seven last year so yeah. i mean well at it this was point, kind it of is funny as a Jets fan sitting through win. all these years of no playoffs. By the way, fan side of the Jet Press is the only fan side site to have never covered a playoff game. So that shows yeah. you how long the drought has been. Yeah. And it was funny <laughs> watching them go through some actual adversity and their heads explode. It's like, oh, welcome to welcome to the NFL. This is how things are for, for most teams for 20 years. It's kind of funny. Well, <laughs> and then it got to a point where people were so focused on the draft, mind you, it's like October and Patriots fans are already like, we want that draft pick that they're rooting against them. So they're starting to win. The defense is starting to like kick it into high gear and win games. And they're, they're pissed off about it. And I'm like, I'm so confused. Sarah, I I've literally done that my entire life outside of two years. So I'm not confused. I get it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like, you get it, but I, you know, I, I can't root against my team, even if it is for a higher draft pick. And I'm like, guys, we still got number three. We got number three. That's better than being number eight. You know what I mean? Like they got a couple wins. You saw some of the good from the players that they've drafted recently. Like, Hey, that's okay. <laughs> There you go. Sarah Marshall with Must Get Fire. Again, giving our Patriots update as they have the third overall draft pick in the 2024 NFL Draft. Make sure you follow her on the X at S-M-A-R-S-H-X-O. Sarah, appreciate it. Thank you, guys.
Uh, just one moment, we'll be joined by Murph from Raiders Fan Radio. I know Richard's working tirelessly hard behind the scenes getting him ready. Whenever Murph is ready, he will hop on. Uh, Murph, baby. Make sure you follow him at Raiders Fan Radio. Uh, it's good seeing you again. We, we've done in person. We've done uh, radio only. But I love seeing your Raiders background, even if it causes me immense pain. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. It's great to be uh, great to be back on with you, Sterling. Thank you for having me, brother. As always, uh, nice to meet you, Mike, and glad to join you as well. And you know all this beautiful Raider uh, adornments that are behind me. But I got one thing that I know you're gonna like. It's that bottle of Woodson whiskey that I owe you. That I'm getting ready to put this in the mail and send it to you. Too bad we bet on the first game between the Chiefs and the Raiders last year, and not the second one. Need I remind you, it ruined your Christmas, twenty to fourteen. Uh, you know what, what happened? Yeah, I may have ruined my. Uh, hey, my don't bring up the rest of the year, Mike. Easy with that. Hey, Murph, he's a Jets fan. That's all he has. The, he's a <laughs> Jets fan. He's just going to agree with me because he goes, "Well, you know, it's not the Raiders, I guess." Um, <laughs> all right, Raiders have thirteenth overall draft pick this year. They're in an interesting spot. Need a quarterback, but thirteen. Where do they go? Do they trade up? Do they stay pat? Try and draft a wide receiver, an offensive lineman, an edge player. Again, the Raiders are in a very unique situation here. What say you? Yeah, I think they're going to do all that stuff. Uh, and, you know, and it depends on what Raider fan you ask or what journalist or broadcaster. Everyone seemingly has uh, a, basically a different answer or a different approach. And I don't think any of them are necessarily wrong. Um, there are some definitely wants for the Raiders, but there are definitely some needs as well. And, and I would even put, oddly enough, I would put quarterback in that wants column and not necessarily that needs column. When we got a guy like Aiden O'Connell who, who's shown that he can win in the league, Shout out the game against Kansas City. Um, but, but yeah, so he's shown that he he can do it. And then we signed Gardner Minshew in the offseason, which was a, a I think a great signing, aside from Kirk Cousins, the best of, uh, available free agent quarterback that's out there, a guy that's scrappy, a guy that almost took an Indianapolis team to the playoffs uh, uh, last year. So I mean, he he's you know, he fits right in with the locker room, like all the things about um Minshew or just scream Raider. So you got two viable guys in there in the locker room already. Um, now, are they bona fide starters and they're going to be franchise guys? They're going to take us to a, a championship and compete with Pat Mahomes year in, year out. I'm not sitting here trying to tell you that either. But what I am saying is that if the Raiders stay at 13, um, there are other positions that are absolute needs for us. We need a, cor a cornerback. Um, so if a guy like Quinion Mitchell is, is sitting there, uh, you know, there's a real world where they could take him. Uh, if Fuaga is sitting there, at, at, uh, although we just signed Cody Whitehair, but I don't think he's going to be much of a, uh, of, of a replacement or starter. He's oddly just going to probably just going to be a depth guy. But so we could take an offensive lineman there, um, but we can also address those needs later in the draft. And here's the thing that's really unique about the Raiders. And I think why everybody has such diverse opinions on this with what, with the needs that we have lines up perfectly with the strengths of this draft. When you look at offensive linemen, you look at corner, you look at quarterback, you look, there are guys all over the place, all over the board in multiple rounds that the Raiders would have an opportunity to, to secure. So, yeah, I mean, I bro, so for me, sort of just my you know dopey opinion, sitting here doing a podcast in my bonus room. Uh, I, I like I like quarterback. I think that in in the NFL, as you know, your team is a perfect example of that. Um, you can't win in the NFL year in year out, compete for championships, make postseason runs without a borderline elite quarterback. You just got to have it. It's like where it kind of starts and stops. And then you have the ability to add a young quarterback on a rookie deal, just like the chiefs did with Mahomes. You find out he's a superstar. And now you've got this window of opportunity to win in the league while you're not committing, you know, 30, $40 million or $50 million in your guys' case a year to the quarterback. So it really makes a lot of sense to me for the Raiders to make a move. You know, I don't, necessarily think they're going to trade up uh, to go get Jaden Daniels you know every I think if you asked any Raider fan and, and they said okay which one which player out of this whole draft would you want to see in the locker room that would be the guy but you got to have somebody that's been willing to trade with you and the draft capital has got to make sense to be able to do it so I don't I think that's a little bit of a pipe dream for us to get him but my my guy is Michael Penix I, I try not to fall in love with players um going into the draft because next thing you know, they're playing for your rival, right? So I, I try not to fall in love with guys, but that's one when the more that I've learned about Michael Penix and gone back and I'm not a tape guy, I'm not an analyst. I'm not any of that kind of stuff. Um, but I just going back and, and just watching through a back, a lot of, uh, of his, of his history in playing also what he did at the senior bowl. Some good friends of ours were down at the senior bowl and saw him firsthand. Um, 
listen to Greg Cosell's scouting reports on him and, and hearing him talk about how he throws the best spiral in uh, he, the best NFL film spiral of the, if anybody in the draft, it's Michael Penix and the amount of discipline that he shows and his dedication to working within the system. And like, there's just to, to me, that would be the guy, but again, I'm just a dopey fan and doing a podcast, in my bonus room. <laughs> Even and I talk a lot. Can you tell Mike? Just ask me a question and sit it back, buddy, and I'll just take it from here. Well, let's see, because even as someone who's on team cornerback for the Raiders, and Terry on Arnold, I think, will end up being the guy from, from Bama. But if you want to go quarterback, it seems like the two that have been projected to the Raiders most frequently just because of where they are are Michael Penix and Bo Nix from Oregon. And they both have major concerns because Penix, I'm sure he wears the injury history where he's blown out the same knee a bunch of different times. He's a good athlete, but he didn't really show a ton of like mobility. I know part of it was just the offense. They had him back there a lot, but I think that's a little concerning because you never know when he's going to go and he's older. And Bo Nix has great stats and great accuracy. Sixth lowest in terms of depth of target in the league. So it was a lot of – in college, excuse me. So it's a lot of dinking and dunking right there. You said you're a big fan of Penix. Why is Nix not necessarily a guy that you think will be a first-round pick for the Raiders? Well, you know what? I, I kind of was on board with, with, with Bo Nix earlier on. And then there was something that he said recently. And, and listen, and I know that um, guys can compartmentalize things in different ways. And it, it, so I don't, I really try not to let it be an entire indictment against the guy. But when he said that playing in the Pac 12 was so much more fun for him, and because when he was playing in the SEC, that the people in the SEC fans, and I live in SEC country, I'm from the Bay Area, but I live just outside of Nashville now, how the SEC fans treat it like religion, and he didn't like that. Well, guess what, Bo? I got news for you, pal. Raider Nation, <laughs> it was freaking, the SEC is Disneyland compared to what you're getting ready to get into if you get drafted by the Raiders. So I just don't see that, that the, the attitude and the culture that Antonio Pierce has brought to our locker room, I don't see a guy that just goes, eh, you know, this football is just something that I do. I, I, do, I just don't see that working out. And that's where I get, um, again, I'm not an analyst or anything, but I really do have an investment in culture and my degrees in leadership. And I really look at the way that organizations are run as a whole and how important that is. I mean, we saw an absolute different Raiders football team when the Antonio Pierce took over uh, versus what we saw with Josh McDaniels. And so that, that culture eats your strategy for breakfast. So you can be the biggest X's and O's guys. You can be really efficient on a stat sheet. You can have a win, a great win loss record in, in Oregon, all that kind of stuff. But your mentality and what he's going to bring to the Raiders locker room, that that's almost equally as important to me. And then, and, and, and I know that may sound funny because, but in the NFL, everyone, Everyone's athletic. Everyone's big. Everyone's strong. Everyone's got those traits. But what are the things that really differentiate them? What what took Max Crosby from being a you know a fourth round draft pick out of Eastern Michigan to being one of the greatest pass rushers in the league right now? It's his dedication and his work ethic and his bracing of the culture and the organization and like that's what rocketed him up and it's and he's almost like a different player now and so that's it. And I don't know if you know if that's a good reason, but just as a fan. Seeing that from Bo Nix, I'm like, nah, no thanks. Like that's that's not what we're that's not what we got going on right now. Well, and the Raiders spent the entire what half of the season when Antonio Pierce took over trying to get rid of that previous regime and the non Raiders mentality. Again, I'm a Chiefs guy, you know this, but you can at least respect what the Raiders do, what they're about, and you know Raider culture. I do think Michael Penix Jr. is a better fit in that regard than again a Bo Nix. If you're talking about the SEC, you'd be in religion again. As you mentioned, get ready for the NFL and especially the Raiders. Um, what has been the offseason like so far? Obviously, Josh Jacobs no longer a Raider. There's been some moving uh, moving parts right here. Christian Wilkins, massive signing coming from Miami. Him alongside Max Crosby is giving me nightmares. Um, <laughs> I, I've actually been fairly high on the Raiders. Again, I try to take uh, everything very objective, right? I, I try not to have fandom lay in the way of what I think a team is going to do. I'm always high on Gardner Minshew as a backup quarterback. Again, you, 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 you nailed it with what he did with the Colts last year. I think what the Colts were last year and the Raiders are going to be this year are very similar. And they were very close to making the playoffs. Mm -hmm. So if you're sitting here and I go, I think the, the Colts could do it. Why couldn't the Raiders? I think the Raiders defense is even better. I'd love to hear your thoughts just in general over the uh, comings and goings of the players so far. Yeah, I think it's been great. I mean, we re-signed Andre James, our center, which I think that was huge, to, again, to keep that consistency. And we already have 
some needs on the offensive line. So I think that was big. Um, uh, you know, we're signing a guy like Amir Abdullah. I think that was that was cool. That I think that was a locker room fit kind of a thing, a leader, you know, special teams kind of guy. Um, I think that 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 helps there. But yeah, Minshew, and then uh, we we kind of talked about him. So, and you're right, and I agree with you 100. percent I think that the Raiders, the Raiders could be. I mean, could be. I know ifs and buts, right? But Raiders could be this year's Texans. I mean, that's if we get. You know what I'm saying? Like it, it kind of is. It could be going that way. Um, and so uh, the signing of Christian Wilkins is just. It's monumental to have Tom Telesco come out of the gate and did that be his first signing uh, for this Raiders team in his tenure now with the Raiders as the GM, I thought just spoke volumes. I thought that that really told us that, that he's in it um, and, and they're not going to, they're going to take some swings and they're not willing to push their chips in and there's, you know, for Vegas style. And I think that's really important for a couple of things is that, uh, this is for the first time in a very long time that it feels like the players, the staff, the coaching staff, front office, and the fans, we're all kind of connected. We're all like, no one's like screaming about our quarterback. There's no car wars going on. There's no, like, no one's, we're not in that world right now. There's a really collective confidence in the direction of this football team. And Tom Telesco and Antonio Pierce's legacy as coach and GM are a hundred percent tied to how this season goes. If the Raiders fail this year or take a step back, you think Tom Telesco's life as a GM is going to be much, it's, you know what I'm saying? Like he's got a really short leash here. And then Antonio Pierce, what's the big knock against him? Well, he's a young head coach. He's never done these been in these certain, you know, game management situations. And he's never like, you know, is it all rah, rah with him? Is it all just this, you know, Raiders? And is, is there substance to that? Is he a leader of men? Is that, all those things, which I don't think those things are arguable to me already. I think he is, but the, but the the more important point is if the Raiders go seven and ten, you think these guys are going to be around next year? I maybe. I mean, certainly not if they have two years of of, of shortcomings. So I think that they're going to take swings. They're going to um, they're they're, they're going to be invested early, which they proved that with Christian Wilkins and and I forget what the guy's name is, the the Buffalo GM, but he had a great quote there the other day is that he said um, when they moved up and they made a big swing for Josh Allen, they said, well, he said, well, if it doesn't work, neither one of us are going to be here anyway. And that's the way I'm looking at the way Tom Telesco has operated so far. Is it like, if this don't work, then none of y'all going to be here anyways. So just freaking swing big and, and let's and let's make it happen. So all that said, to answer your question, that's absolutely feel great about the way this offseason has gone. There's a lot of goodwill and a lot of merriment amongst Raider Nation, and it's been a hot minute since I could say that. Uh, Mike, before I get to you in one second here, a couple of comments I want to get to. One from Ron says, I don't know who this Murph guy is, but he's the best guest <laughs> you've ever had. Congrats, best guest you've ever had, Murph. Uh, Jalen, thank you, Jalen. I know you're a Chiefs guy, too. Says Murph is great. So you even get the love from Chiefs. Oh, uh, thanks, guys. Uh, um, this one up here says, hey, Sterling, are you really worried about Minshew and O'Connell playing the Chiefs, be honest, no, not necessarily in the, in the nutshell of that. I think they're Super Bowl contenders, but I mean, they did get one last year. Things had to go their way, obviously. Uh, a couple of defensive scores, but I think they're a very good team outside of quarterback. And I think Gardner Minshew is one of the best backup quarterbacks in the NFL. Again, I don't think he's a starter that necessarily is going to move the needle, but I think he's a good enough quarterback when you have a very talented roster around him to win nine maybe 10 games again, comes down to scheduling and no, I don't think they take down Kansas city, but again, I have liked a lot of the moves the Raiders have made. Um, Michael, go to you now. Scale of one to 10. How confident are you right now in Tom Telesco? Because I'm sure you have to be thrilled as a Raiders fan that he finds a gem in Justin Herbert and then completely screws up his rookie contract. <laughs> and now the chargers are still digging out from under that. They had like what? 70 million over the cap when the off season begun. So I mean, that's why they got put there was Tom Telesco kind of spending a lot on veteran guys, and he did it again this year with Wilkins. So he's had some draft hits, but are you really confident in Telesco's ability to build a roster? Yeah, I am. You know, um, to, you know, to answer your question about like the salary cap stuff. So uh, Tom wasn't responsible for the for the the contracts in 
in Los Angeles. Uh, and he won't be responsible for them with the Raiders either. So we've got a guy for that, that, that handles that stuff. So I don't, I don't pin that entirely uh, on Telesco. And in terms of his ability to build a roster, you know, and I know Sterling can attest to this, what the, the most, there's no one in the history of the NFL has more Lombardi trophies in August than the Chargers. Like, I don't know what it is with this annual love fest with this football team. It's been going on ever since the days of Phillip Rivers, where every media member has to pencil them in and winning the AFC West and making a playoff run and being Super Bowl contenders. It's they always have the quarterbacks. They're like eventually one of these years, so they got a breakthrough. Like right. Well, but and and so do you to to your question about the roster. Well, the knock of those Chargers teams were never the roster. It was always coaching. When you got a dope like Brandon Staley going for it on fourth and or on fourth down with four yards to go from your own twenty yard line and turning the ball over to us so we can knock them out of the playoffs, like what a dumbass, right? So like th th that was the problem with those with those teams. And even going past Brandon Staley, all the, the shortcomings were always it seemingly was with coaching. Like they always came up short uh, on that. It wasn't roster when you every when you look at it, the the Chargers roster, the media loved it every single year. So yeah, I'm. Highly confident in his ability to, and he's shown some certain trends. Um, you know, like he doesn't typically draft uh, first round corners. Uh, Jason Verrett, I think, might have been the last first round corner that he drafted. Other than that, they build through free agency and they build through the later rounds of the draft. So, you know, maybe some of these later, you know, uh, corners we'll be looking at, you know, not Mitchell, not Terry and Arnold, not Kool Aid McKintry, like, like somebody on a little further down the road. So I, I could certainly see uh, Telesco doing something like that. Um, same thing with his, uh, the other knock against him when he was in, in San Diego was the, his lack of ability to sign guys to second contracts. That, that, that was like, well, you know, he drafts, you know, this linebacker or whoever, but then when he couldn't get into that second contract, well, maybe that's because there was so much coaching change that you had a little bit more of a frequency and roster turnover. Lord knows we've seen that with the Raiders. Every time we get a new head coach, it's like clean house for a bit, you know, so including this time. Um, so I, I, I am confident in it. Now, does that mean that, you know, am I completely convinced? No, that that not either. I mean, there are still question marks, but that's the thing, though, is that like everybody's got question marks around everything that's not the Kansas City Chiefs. They're the only team that can just like just win it and it doesn't matter because they're just going to draft their ass off and freaking, you know, sign superheroes like it just it's going to happen as long as Andy Reid and, and Kermit the Frog are on the same football team like they're going to keep rattling off championships and it's up to us to go knock their ass off the off the mantle there. But um, but anyways, point being, though, is that, yeah, I think everyone's got questions um and the ones that and the the questions that have come up i don't think are as concerning as compared to the stuff that we've had to deal with over the last 20 years for the most part uh, i want to bring up hunter renfro just specifically here for a moment because he had that thousand yard season had a really good year things were going awesome and then josh mcdaniels comes to town and he seemingly can't get on the field he's only 28 years old was this a case of he's washed and all of a sudden he just does not have any more. Was this Josh McDaniels? Because he's still a free agent right now. One of the, I don't know, bigger named wide receiver free agents still on the market based on age. You know, OBJ, the name's out there, but he's what, 31 now, multiple injuries. Hunter Renfro seemingly could be a guy that could get picked up by multiple teams. I was kind of surprised that maybe he didn't go back to the Raiders unless he goes, I don't care. I know that Josh is gone. I don't want to have anything to do with the Raiders anymore. What's your take on him specifically? You know that was a it's a really perplexing thing there. I th the the short answer, which I'm not typically capable of doing, Sterling. You know that. Uh, <laughs> the short answer is that he Josh McDaniels broke him, um, and and you know between when you take a guy that runs creatively, as he was able to under John Gruden, where John was like hey man i don't care how you get there just get there right like just get to your spot just get there get there on time and hunter would do all kinds of hunter stuff all those different triple moves and everything that he would do to get to that to that spot where josh mcdaniels was like nope you have to do it specifically this way and if you don't do it this exact way then we're not going to be successful well instead of just letting the guy flourish again speaking of culture eats strategy for breakfast your strategy may be great but if you don't allow the guy to do what he does best then you stifle him and then you couple that with a couple of concussions and i think that it just it it really impacted his ability to bounce back and i, I really do i think he was probably and i don't know i'm just i'm guessing i'm not at dinner with the guy but i think mentally he kind of was broken down by josh mcdaniels and the reason that i, I, I that I, I feel that way is that when you look at when 
the change happened. I mentioned there was two different Raider teams last year. We could almost split the season in half, and, and there were two different versions of the Raiders last year. The second half version of the Raiders saw more productivity out of every wide receiver, every pass catcher. So Michael Mayer, Trey Tucker, Devontae Adams, everyone improved. Jacoby Myers stayed about the same. Everyone else improved except for one guy, Hunter Renfro. Well, why is that? Where did Hunter go? I thought for sure when Antonio Pierce took over, I thought, okay, McDaniels is gone. That's out of the way. Now Hunter can just go back to being Hunter, but he never did. And so I'm really curious. I'm really rooting for the guy because he was great, man. We used to make jokes about him all the time. You know, he'll, he'll do your taxes and then put you in a blender on a freaking China route. You know what I mean? Like the guy, he was awesome to root for and he was great as a Raider and I wish him nothing but the best. And, you know, maybe he ends up in like New Orleans or something and, you know, he links back up with Derek and, you know, try to find some, some, some magic there again for him. But I, I do wish him the best, man, because I think he was a hell of a player, man. And, and hopefully he still can be. Can't McD wait for him to end up in was great because when they hired him, they're like, maybe he learned from his mistakes in Denver, and it was the exact same thing. To yeah, him yeah, see ten yeah. years later, no um, changes. And, oh, and he had us all snowed too, Mike. I mean, it was like we thought for sure he was saying the right things. He's going on the Bussing with the Boys podcast. Shout out our buddy Will. Like he's doing all the right things, sounding great. And it was like, nope, he had us all fooled, man. That guy, I mean. That fattier, dopey idiot, man. I hope I never see him back anywhere close to Las Vegas ever again. Yeah, I don't think you will. Uh, Murph, Especially from, after calling him that on your show. Yeah, Sorry. You're dopey idiot. That's a quote. <laughs> uh, Merv from Raiders Fan Radio. Dude, I always appreciate it. I can't wait for that uh, Woodson whiskey. I'll make sure to crack it open during the Chiefs Raiders game. Again, kind of a lesson. Don't bet, don't bet with a Chiefs guy, Murph. Just don't do it. I mean, I went to Vegas for Radio Row. I left up 60, so I'm actually surprised that Vegas <laughs> casinos are still standing after my beatdown on them. Uh, well, actually, I just got to know how I have a better timing, Sterling. I got I should have bet you for Christmas. Mm. And so next time, we'll bet the one in, in Arrowhead again, okay? Not <laughs> Vegas, but in Arrowhead. Apparently, we can do a halfway decent job. We beat there, what, two out of the last four years? We got you guys in, in uh, an Arrowhead, yeah? Yeah, a lot to show for it, too. Yeah. Murph, always appreciate it, man. <laughs> Uh, take it easy, bro. All right, guys. Take care. See you, Mike. See you. Uh, Going to be joined now by Reed Wallach, talking Giants. Dude, always love talking with Murph. One of my favorite guys to talk to. Again, he makes me actually enjoy talking Raiders. That's so hard to do. Got to give Murph a ton of credit. Joined now by Reed Wallach from Bet Side of Talking Giants football. Reed, how are you? I'm good, guys. Uh, thank you for having me on. I, I don't have any whiskey or any liquor to you know wager or bet on or promote, but I do have a pretty dire NFL uh, team that is uh, in need of a spark here at the draft. So uh, happy to get into it with you guys. <laughs> yeah, to say that is uh, putting it mildly. A lot of money to a quarterback who is uh, two scoops of ass in Daniel Jones. <laughs> you draft in sixth overall, and the issue there is, well, you're most likely not getting one of the top three guys. So then are you content with J.J. McCarthy? Are you going to try and say, you know what, I'm going to talk myself into Michael Penix. Where do the Giants go at six? Yeah, it's a pretty interesting question because I, the team isn't super screwed big picture. The team, obviously, not as talented. They need some help. But it's not like, okay, they need a quarterback right now. They got to jumpstart everything. Because, listen, Daniel Jones is under contract. They have the out after this year. I think the bigger overarching question is, is Brian Dable coaching for his job this season? Because we're in year two. Year one was a glowing success. He took this underachieving bunch to the playoffs. Really good. They inked Daniel Jones's contract. And I was after that season, like, I like Brian Dable. I like what he's doing here. I think Daniel Jones proved he's a talented quarterback. But I don't know if you want to invest such a, so many resources into this core. And now you see them starting to pull it back, right? They don't re-sign Barkley. Jones, his long-term path with the Giants is a little up in the air now. So the Giants have options. They don't need to go quarterback. They can if they want. I don't think they should move up to go get the guy. I would say if it were up to me and they were to do that, it would be Drake May. He's my favorite of the non-Caleb Williams bunch. But the team is in pretty decent position if they don't go quarterback because I see the top five breaking down in some fashion. The four quarterbacks, Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, Drake May, J.J. McCarthy, in any order, and then Marvin Harrison Jr. I think those are going to be the top five picks. Hmm. So the Giants have some 
flexibility here. They can move back, which I'm always a proponent of. They could take either Malik Neighbors or Roma Dunze. So I think that there are options. I think we're going to learn a lot about what the direction of the franchise is, though, next Thursday night, where I think if they move up for a quarterback, if they draft a quarterback, that probably means that Dable and Shane are trying to keep their jobs and say, hey, we just drafted this guy. We got to give him a we gotta give him a shot after Daniel Jones uh, you know, flames out this season. Let me throw this out for you right here. Let's just say, for example, it goes Caleb. Let's just say Drake and Jaden, two, three, mm -hmm. four to the Cardinals. You have Marvin Harrison Jr. I think mm -hmm. the Chargers are staying at five. They're going to draft all the left tackle right there. Let's just say JJ's on the board at six. What do the Giants do? It's a it's a tricky scenario because I I'm of the belief I like JJ McCarthy. I know he's a polarizing prospect. Uh, I obviously host the college football show here. If you listened yeah. during the college football season, I was the one saying I think JJ McCarthy is the goods. I think he's a first round talent. I don't know if I think he's a top five prospect, but I think he's really raw. And I don't know if it's worth the Giants sinking in a top ten pick into making that decision. Listen, if the coaching staff and the GM, they deem that he's worthy of this pick, then listen, you got to go with it. But I think it really, it, it it feels like there's a big log jam there, right? It just feels like the team is going to be like, you have two timelines going at the same pace here where, all right, is Jones the guy? Are you you got to play JJ now if this year gets off to a wrong start. What happens if Dable has another blow up with his coaching staff where guys are dying to get out of East Rutherford? I think the Giants are better suited Give it one more year with Jones. Let that contract expire. If they stink again, then guess what? You're right back where you are next year, and you can take another quarterback. So I don't know if it's the most prudent decision to take J.J. If they do, though, I could see myself buying in because I do like the upside of J.J. McCarthy. The Daniel Jones extension reminds me of when the Broncos took Paxton Lynch and that they make the move, and then immediately they're like, oh, we made a huge mistake. Like like instantly after they took him, they're like, oh, he can't play. That's the issue the Giants are doing that too. Like. They were all in on Daniel Jones. Then he has that nightmare Cowboys debut. Then mm -hmm. Arizona, he needed like a miracle comeback. He gets shut out, shut out again. Excuse me. And then we're like, oh, man. like immediately, like they didn't even like have any pretense that they're gonna try to keep the Daniel Jones era going. It seems like it's either he gets one more year or we clean break and he's done. That's that's the biggest fear, and that's the issue with like mild success and overachieving in one year is that all the contracts came home. It's like, okay, we got to, we got to invest in this. Like, what does it say? And it's, it's easier said than done. Right. And you can look back and say, Oh, well, they should have just gotten rid of Jones then, or they shouldn't have extended him. They should have tagged him. But you know, the giants coming off of a year where they were projected to win, what, like five games, they go to the playoffs. They, you know, they end up beating the Vikings who were overrated. And we all kind of knew that at the time. Then they get smoked by the Eagles who went to the Super Bowl. It's not that big of a deal, but it was an over – like you got to build on that, right? Like the Giants have been down the dumps for a while, but very quickly you saw that that team overachieved and that wasn't sustainable, and now you're seeing the the repercussions of your actions. Again, though, it's a pretty big step to draft a quarterback inside the top 10 when you still have a big price to pay on Dan Jones. Like what – I don't know what that's saying to – the organization, I think it's going to set up a lot of roadblocks ahead. So to me, I would go receiver or trade back either, whether it's, I imagine Marvin Harrison Jr. is going to be gone by then. Malik Neighbors, Roma Dunze, whoever's graded higher. I'm personally a Roma Dunze fan, but I'm not going to say Mar Malik Neighbors isn't also nasty. Um, or trade back. Maybe someone wants to move up and you, you know, stockpile more assets for the future. Yeah, I, I think 31 other teams weren't doing that Daniel Jones contract, but the Giants, all you need is one. Uh, again, let's we'll, we'll stick there then with wide receiver or trading back. If you had your druthers, what would you choose? Again, personally, I think it makes the most sense for the Giants to trade back. Um, again, I, I, I think you, you mentioned a team is going to want that quarterback, and I still think how the top five currently is constructed I, I think top five, they all have their guys. They all have their spot. So it's the Giants at six is where I think the the real action, the real fun comes into play. Would you prefer the Giants to trade back and get multiple shots instead of one of the, you know, kind of the next tier down of wide receivers? Or do you think, you know what, let's take a shot on one of those higher end wide outs? Well, the Giants, the Giants definitely need a, a number one receiver, in my opinion. They really do need kind of game-breaking blue chip talent. And again, you're going to most likely have two cracks at it, whether it's Malik Neighbors or Roma Dunze. So if the Giants stay put, 
I'm cool with it. I think that's a great decision. And I don't think you could really go wrong with either of them. I think that they're both really good. But I, I'm i always a proponent around the draft, especially with a team like the Giants where there are multiple holes. This isn't a team that like is a receiver away from competing with the Giants and Eagles, in my opinion. They need a little bit of help. So if they were to move back, let's just say – someone want to move up for the Joe Alts of the world, or they really like Dallas Turner and want to move up, move back to the middle of the first round, maybe pick up a third round pick along the way. Can't hurt because this is a receiver heavy draft. You know, you got Brian Thomas flying up draft boards. I think AD Mitchell is going to be a stud. Lad McConkey, maybe not the number one receiver, but if the Giants have a high grade on him, uh, that would fit Brian Dable's system, given what we've seen him, what him do in Buffalo. So, There is a lot of talent there. So if someone's going to come up and really offer for number six and they move back, it's tough to lose a trade when you're moving back and you're accumulating assets and you need some help. So I I know I'm not giving a really uh, a defining answer here, but I do think that the Giants are in a pretty good position to bolster their franchise in a positive way, whether it's take a receiver or trade back and get some help there. Quarterback is where I'm a little iffy on what that says about the direction of the team. Reed, we've been talking a lot about the direction of the Giants, and it seems like they are kind of like stuck in this middle ground, yeah. but then they go out and make these moves in the offseason, like the whole Brian Burns trade, which that doesn't seem like a move you do if you're in the, in the middle or you're trying to rebuild. And then they basically sign an entirely new offensive line, Jermaine Illuminor, John Runyon, which it's weird to see John Runyon's son playing for the Giants. That's going to yeah. be kind of awkward in that household, but – like looking at these moves too, though, especially on the defensive side too, Jordan Phillips, Jalen, Mil- like new starters coming in. Yeah. What's your take on where the defense lies, especially ahead of this draft? Because it still seems like even though they have an offensive coach and Brian Dable and mm. so much of the probably pre-draft attention is going to be focused on either getting a quarterback or helping the current quarterback, whoever that is, where do you think the defense is going to stand right now? I still think like it's going to be a, de- a defense first team and a very aggressive team. The defense down the stretch of the season but led the Giants to some victories. I mean, the Giants finished the year. It, it was a disaster of a season, a lost year, especially once Jones got hurt against the Raiders. But the defense was what really trended up towards the end of the season. And that's why it kind of hurts that a guy like Wink Martindale is now the D.C. at Michigan. He wanted to get out of there so fast. So the defense is in a pretty good spot. Again, it's if the offense comes together and – Again, there's a lot of differing voices coming out around the draft about what the Giants are going to do. But it does seem like, one, the team has a lot of confidence in DJ. Even when the team was struggling, it did seem like there was this more like, first of all, the offensive line got so hurt in the first two weeks of the year that there's nothing Jones could even do. I, like No one could thrive in that situation. That Seattle game was a travesty. Exactly. Among so I do think that there is, at least amongst the play- players, confidence in Jones. But again, when you start to struggle and you feel the heat on your seat, you start to lose rational thought, right? And you start to feel the pressure and you start to make more short-sighted decisions. Or in this case, it's a take a quarterback in the top 10 and kind of force Jones out. So I do think, listen, low ceiling, absolutely. But like, can the Giants be in like that? La- I mean, first of all, the NFC is a far cry from the AFC in terms of talent. So uh, I can the Giants fight for that final wild card spot with a few, you know, breaks go their way with that defense and maybe a healthy Daniel Jones. Absolutely. A hundred percent. If you go with the rookie quarterback route though, that might back again, you're running into a backlog here of talent and development. So I'm personally believe they should run back Jones one more time. And if you fail, you have the out after this year and then you get your back at the top of the draft. And then that's where you address the quarterback issue. Yeah. Again, the defense of the giants, I do think is going to be a a fairly salty one uh, the entire year, but I want to get back to Brian Dayball because I like Brian Dayball. I thought he was a great OC with the Buffalo bills. I think Josh Allen had his best year for the table as the OC, but is that who he is? Is he a great OC and the head coaching position might be too much for him because after the information came up between him and Wink Martindale, I mean, Wink Martindale, Hell of a coach, right? Very widely respected. And the way he left, very unceremoniously, it was not ideal. Yeah. What did you make of the entire blow up and then Brian Dable as a head coach? It's it's pretty bad, honestly. I'm not going to lie. And it does feel like uh, eventually there's going to be a reckoning. And it does feel like he's not long for the job. Just, you know, you have Mike Kafka, who's the OC for the Giants. He was looking to mo- make like lateral moves to other offensive jobs to get out of this his deal with the Giants. So clearly, look, you're 
on your best days, you're a great coach, but you also on your worst days have to be a great coach. And, you know, you have to be able to keep the team together. And it seems like there's been a serious disconnect between Dable and his assistants. Obviously, the GM Joe Shane comes from the Bills, too. So I'm sure that they have a pretty good working relationship. But it's pretty damning to see those reports come out. And listen, I'm sure where there, you know, people try to round up on Dable and, you know, really pile on him. And, you know, you see one report, then you can add another one, and then another source comes out and it snowballs. But listen, it's tough to shake those things because, like I said, the Giants are at best fighting for a wild card spot next year. Like the last one at that, like a, you know, a bunch of middling teams trying to get the best, uh, you know, coin flip in their weight against the playoffs. Like that's not because then if you end up seven and 10 and you miss the playoffs, like Dable's probably out. Unless, again, you draft a quarterback, you give yourself like, hey, we got to, this is my guy. I didn't draft Jones. You got to give me another go. Like that's, but that's what happens with these teams where you're in a bad situation. To me, like if he would have gotten fired this year, like would not have been the biggest surprise. Probably a little too quick at a year removed from winning coach of the year. But listen, if everyone around, if it's not a good work environment, if this Giants team gets off to another slow start, like is the same thing just going to happen again? Probably, right? Like, this clearly is Brian Dable's manner in how he carries out business, and that's totally fine. Uh, you know, I'm sure when you're winning, being a hard ass is super cool, and, you know, every, he brings out the best in them. But when you're losing, it's pretty tough to, you know, listen to that and you tune them out pretty quickly, and then you get, you know, some pretty poor results. So, uh, unfortunately, I don't think he's long for the job because I don't think that the Giants are going to be able to shake off last year all that much to offset his negative qualities. The great uh, Greg Rosenthal had a very good tweet. It was in October of last year, I think during the Buffalo game, when he had another blow up on the sidelines. And he said, Brian Dable is very quick to tell people it's not his fault. Yeah. That's he's okay. like everything. He's always, every time it cut to him, he's screaming and yelling and pointing his finger at somebody. And it's always somebody else screwed something up, which yeah. that honestly feels kind of Belichick New England because he was a Belichick New England guy way back when, before he went to Alabama and Buffalo. I feel like he's still got some residual Belichick coach who is losing, not like Matt Patricia bad in Detroit or Romeo Cornell bad in Cleveland, but I feel like there's some residue no, hanging around. And Dable, he's proven he could run, first of all, with the assets that the Giants have run out there at, at on offense the past two years. Dable's really made the most of that. So oh, yeah, yeah. he's definitely a good football mind. But again, when you're the head coach, though, it's a different type of job. You got to be able to you know match personalities. And you know we're comparing – like Belichicky and stuff where he's able to get it, dig into people. Those teams also won a lot. So when you win, it's easy to listen and put up with that. But again, once the losing starts, it's how you handle that. And it clear, like sore loser sounds so immature, right? But like, it's clear that Brian Dable can't handle losing as well. And that's a pretty damning thing because again, I think the Giants are going to lose a fair bit next year. I don't know if they'll be as dismal as last year, but I think it's going to be a long year in uh, New York yet again. Yeah. Uh, again, sixth overall draft pick for the Giants. Reed Wallach, make sure you check him out on BetSided as well as on here during the college football season. R-E-E-D-W-A-L-L-A-C-H. Mike, this was fun, dude. Thanks for oh. filling in for uh, for good old Ian. No problem. I mean, this is, this is my time of year. I just finalized my big board, which was 400 players. I got my mock draft uh, in the chamber. It'll go up. Uh, the day before the draft, so this is this is what I do with my free time because I ain't dating anybody. So this is how you this is how you spend the hours is grinding film that looks like it was Zapruder film from weird colleges that you didn't know existed. Did you Dog know there's a Pittsburgh the in Kansas? I did because that's how I found a player this year. I do because I live in Kansas and it's a pretty big college. Well, D2. there you go. It's really that big. I didn't hear about this until I'm the now. only guy you could talk to about uh, from Kansas. And he's like, well, like, well, actually, <laughs> I got decent baseball. Come on now. I know all about Pittsburgh, Kansas. Uh, Mike, well, I'm just a humble Central Jersey kid. How am I supposed to know about D2 Kansas schools? Uh, Mike, uh, Mike dates the game. That's what Mike's doing. Reed, appreciate it, man. We hit on the Giants. Hit on the Patriots, hit on the Raiders. If you're a fan of those three teams, make sure you check this podcast out. Ian should be back next week. Until then, we are out.